All right, hello everybody. Hope you're all perked up after the coffee. Yes. Um, so today we're going to talk about general game playing in uh, My name is Steve. I go by Steve Wash on Twitter. Um, I posted uh, some clickable versions of the links and my paper as well uh, on Twitter right before this talk. So if you don't want to type everything out by hand, uh, you can just go there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, find me on Twitter or after the talk at lunch. Uh, I'm going to use basically all of the hour to do this because I have a lot to so you might have also seen me on Freenode if you hang out in Lisp or Lisp games. That's SJL. And I'm also the same on GitHub and GitHub if you want to look at my terrible code. Uh, so like I've already said, this is a tutorial. So my goal here is not to present new research or anything. Nothing here is new. Um, my goal is just to give you a sense of how you can actually get started making the computer do this thing called general game playing today, like right now, during lunch, if you want to. That's my only goal. I'm not going to dive into, into some heavy AI stuff or anything. I'm just going to just going to give you the lay of the land so you can explore on your own after this talk. Cool. Uh, so humans have been interested in making machines play games for a really long time, like a really really long time, right? And we solved it, right? Right? In 1770, we had the Mechanical Turk. It was a machine that could play chess and beat chess masters and even do the nice tour. Like we're done. What are, what are we doing here? Right? The only problem is this kind of cheated by sticking a human in the bottom of the box. So that's the only um, and so it took us a while. It took us a while to catch up to this. Actually, uh, it took until the late '90s with Deep Blue actually beating a chess master. Um, and obviously, we we've gone quite a ways since that. Um, Stockfish is ridiculously powerful now, stuff like that. Um, but there's more games than just chess in the world, right? And so the one that probably springs to mind is uh, Go, which was in the news recently, AlphaGo uh, last year. Um, beat they it all at you know at Go, and so. Okay, so we've got two games under our belt. Cool. Um, but all these things have a problem, and the problem is that I can beat Deep Blue at tic-tac-toe. Because Deep Blue doesn't play tic-tac-toe, right? It, it doesn't know how to do this thing, right? And I can beat Deep Blue at Connect 4, or Checkers, or anything that's not chess. It'll kick my ass at chess. Um, but anything else, it can't do, right? So what if we had AIs that could play any game, right? That weren't just limited to a single game, right? Uh, so that's the goal of this field of general game playing, is to make AIs that can play any game, just given the rules and some time to think about them. So you give the, the bot the rules, they think about it for a little bit, and then they can play at least reasonably intelligently. That's the goal here. Um, but we need to be careful, because uh, what even is a game? So chess and checkers are clearly games. Is a Rubik's Cube a game? Kind of. It's a single player puzzle. What about like competitive hot dog eating? I don't know if we're going to have an AI playing that anytime soon. Uh, so we need to set some restrictions on ourselves to start, right? We can't just say, we can't just try to bite off everything at once. Uh, and so people studying general game playing have kind of settled on a particular class of games that we want to solve first, or figure out how to get our heads around first. And once we solve those, then we'll start broad broadening our horizons and moving on to other stuff. Um, and so this class has seven characteristics, and we're going to go through each of them. It'll be really quick. Uh, first, our field is really only interested in discrete games. So stuff where the, the, the game has discrete states, like chess, or poker, or something like that, right? Um, we're not interested in something like tennis that's continuous, right? Uh, we want all of our games to be finite, and this is just because we're lazy and don't want to deal with infinite loops. Um, so we want all games to terminate eventually, after some finite number of loops. It can be a, big, a whole lot of them, but we just never want our games to go into an infinite loop and go back to the same state twice. Uh, we want all of our games to be playable, which means that at any given point, Either the game's over, or each player has a move. Right? We never want to back a, corner, a player into a corner where they can't make a move, but the game somehow has to go on, which is reasonable, right? Um, and finally, we want the games to be winnable. This one's kind of wishy-washy. Uh, some of the games in the GDL's uh, tournaments you'll see don't actually follow this, but what it means is that every player, at least in theory, has a chance to win. So if the other players are dumb enough, any particular role in the game can win. So tic-tac-toe, for example, is winnable because if you're playing against a really stupid opponent, you can win, no matter which side you're on. Uh, and so then the three other bits that we want, um, we're only concerned about games where everybody moves at once. Uh, and this sounds really bad, right? How do you model something like tic-tac-toe with this, right? Uh, where it's a turn-taking game. Uh, you can do a little hack to get around that by just saying, okay, whoever has control gets to actually do the move, and the other player, when they don't have control, the only move they can do is called no off. Right? And so, just saying that every game is simultaneous moves makes all the games the same, uh, and you can hack easily uh, turn-taking games into this model to fit it. Uh, and so, also, we're only concerned with perfect information games. So 
games like chess where you can see the entire state uh, at once, um, not games like poker where there's some hidden state. And also, we only care about deterministic games, so no randomness. These last two are actually being relaxed right now with extension to the stuff I'm going to talk about. Um, so we are broadening our horizons a little bit already. Um, but we're, uh, we're trying to stick close to this, this set of games just so that we have somewhere that's not too crazy to start. Cool. So uh, the rest of this talk is going to be divided into three chunks. First, we're going to talk about uh, reasoning, which is, so how do we even programmatically describe games so that a computer can play them, just given a set of rules? What, what are the rules look like? Then we're going to talk about playing games, so how to, how to compete against other people in the general game playing community. And finally, we're going to talk about how to make our player at least a little more intelligent. Um, we're going to make, well, I, I made, you're going to see, two players uh, during this. One of them's going to be really stupid, and one of them's going to be slightly less stupid. Um, and so then, you'll have all the bits and pieces you need to go make your own. Uh, so we're going to start with reasoning. So this is how we take a set of rules and figure out how they work. So let's think about a game like Tic-Tac-Toe or Knots and Crosses. Uh, so what happens is we start with an empty board, so we have some initial state of the game, right? And then uh, the players make a move. So O has a no-op move, they don't have to do anything. But X gets to choose one of nine spaces to make a move, right? And so when X picks a move, the next, sta the next state of the game is determined by that move. So the moves change states into other states, right? And then obviously from those states, O gets to make a move, and so on and so on. Uh, and so all the games in this class that we're interested in can be modeled similarly to this. Um, so we have this tree of states, and eventually they end where one player has one, or it's a draw, or whatever. And so what we need is a programmatic way to describe the rules of these games so that a computer can read them and, and parse them and hopefully do something smart with them. Uh, and so the folks at Stanford, the Stanford Logic Group, uh, came up with this thing called Game Description Language. Uh, which is a logic programming language. It conveniently uses S expressions, so everybody here is going to be really happy about that. You don't have to learn some crazy prolog syntax. Um, it's actually an extended version of data log, which is a, kind of like a restricted prolog-ish. Who here has used some kind of logic programming language? Anybody? Oh, sweet. Wow, this is going to be easier than I thought. All right, cool. Uh, so here you go. I'm done. Uh, so, <laughs> so this is tic-tac-toe. We're going to go through each a little bit individually. Don't worry, I'm not going to make your eyes bleed. Um, but this is the entire definition of tic-tac-toe in GDL. Uh, so uh, let's start with the basics. Uh, how do we represent a state in a game? So state, uh, we define by saying there's this true predicate. Anything in true is in the state. So let's just take a look at an example. It'll be easy if you're smart. Um, so we have this board, right, with tic-tac-toe. It's X's turn. So we say true, control, control X. Can I point? So true control x, and then we just say that cell 1, 1 has an x, cell 1, 2 has an o, and all the rest of the cells are playing. I probably didn't leave a point. That's pretty obvious. All right, cool. So a state is just a set of facts. That's all it is, right? Um, so now that we've got that, we can actually start defining how a game works. So we start with these two predicates. So we define the roles of the game, and we define the initial state of the game. And these are pretty simple, uh, especially for a game like tic-tac-toe. We just have two roles, x and o. Um, every GDL game has a fixed number of roles. You, can't, you can have as many players as you want, one or more, um, but they have to be fixed. You can't have a variable number of players. Um, and then we define the initial state of the game by just listing out the set of facts and just saying init instead of true. And that's it. So in, in tic-tac-toe, we start x, uh, x starts and everything's one. Simple enough. All right, so to actually do some interesting things with this stuff, to with the states, we need a way to, to do rules. And so in GDO, the, the logical inference or logical rule operator is the less than or equal to operator. I think it's supposed to look like an ASCII arc arrow. I hate hieroglyphic function names. But yeah, so th this is a rule, and it has a head, and then zero or more bodies. Are and so the head is true if everything in the body is true. If you're a logic programming person, you, you get this. Um, don't worry too much if you've never done logic programming. After the next five-ish minutes, you don't have to think about it again if you don't want to. Um, so let's look at a couple of rules in tic-tac-toe. Uh, so we have a rule to define what a row is. So a person has a row, or a row has a mark, right? You can say like row one is x. If cell x, or cell one, one is x, cell one, two is x, and cell one, three is x, right? Um, oh, yeah, and so in GDL, logic variables are named with the question mark. 
And so you can also define you know, column and diagonal, which I didn't do here because it's just copying and pasting the same thing two more times. Um, <clears throat> and so then we can define other rules that use the, the simpler rules. So we define line to say uh, a person has a line if they have a row, if they have a column, or if they have a diagonal, right? Sure. And then we also need a way to say whether the game is over or not, because we have to, the games have to terminate, right? And tic-tac-toe has a very specific termination condition. Either someone's won or the board is full and we can't move anymore. Um, so we just make a predicate called open that returns tr that, re that is true if any cell is blank, if there's at least one blank cell in the current state. Make sense? Cool. I see heads shaking that's good. Not me. Um, so to actually define the flow of the game, we define these four predicates. And this is all we need to define the whole game. Uh, so the first is terminal, and it does what you probably think it does. It just says whether the game is over or not, given the current state. So if we have a line, if x has a line in our current state, or if o has a line in our current state, or if we're not open, then the game is over in tic-tac-toe. Um, and this is the first time we see negation. Uh, GDL does have negation. There are a few restrictions on negation and recursion in GDL that I'm not going to talk about here. You can look at spec if you're interested. Uh, it's a little tricky, so it, and it's really important for this talk. Um, but yeah. So we've got negation. Uh, the next thing we want to do is say who wins, because it's not really interesting if we just say the game is over without saying who won. So in GDL, the scores go from 0 to 100 in uh, with higher scores being better by convention. Uh, and so we say, okay, a player gets a goal of 100 if they have a line. So if X has a line, then goal X is 100. Fairly simple. Um, the next one's a little trickier. We say a player gets a score of 0 if the other player has a line. We can see that if you're used to logic programming, you know you can't just you know say line other and be done with it because other and player can unify to the same thing, right? So we need to add this distinct constraint, and distinct is another one of these magic GDL keywords that they added to the language that just ensures that the things are not not the same, don't unify. Yeah. Um, so we lose if the other player has a line, and then if neither player has a line and we're not open, the game is the game is over. Then everybody just gets a, a score of 50. It's just a draw, right? This is the tic-tac-toe you all know and love. Uh, so next, there's two more things we need to define for actually defining a game. We need to define the legal moves of a game, so what can a person do in every state, right? Because every player has to have a move in every state. This is the, the playable condition of GDL. Um, so let's do that. Uh, so in every non-terminal state. In a terminal state, it doesn't matter. You don't need to have legal moves. It can just be garbage. Um, okay, so uh, in tic-tac-toe, there's two different moves you can do. It's legal for you to mark a cell, with your, with your mark, uh, if that cell is currently blank and you currently have control. So well enough, you can't mark over a cell that already has something and you have to be in control. Uh, and then likewise, it's legal for you to do a no-op if the other player has control. And again, we have to use this distinct <coughs> to make sure that other and player don't unify just to each other. Um, yeah, so that's it for tic-tac-toe. Oh, nope, sorry, the most important part. Uh, so now we've got a state and we've got some moves. How do we turn it into a new game state? So what we do is we define this next predicate. And so basically we, re we rebuild the next state from scratch at every iteration. So what happens is that the thing doing the reasoning about the GDL is going to say, okay, I figured out what moves everybody's doing. I'm going to add them as, we'll see in a second, does predicates. And then I'm just going to compute next of everything. And then I'm going to take all that and I'm going to turn it into true of all that stuff. And I'm just going to plop that into the state or into the, the current database, the logic database. Uh, so let's look at an example. So uh, control is pretty simple. If O has control in this turn, then in the next turn, X will have control, and vice versa. Uh, we also have something that any cell that's already marked stays marked in the next turn. Right? If I mark an X, it's never going to get erased, although there are some variants of tic-tac-toe that you can do that, but not this one. Uh, so any cell that already has a player's mark that's not blank stays marked in the next turn, and forever on. Simple. Next one's a little trickier. Um, not too much trickier. If a player chooses to mark a blank cell, that cell has their mark in the next turn. So if cell 1 1 is currently blank and I'm X and I say uh, mark 1 1, then in the next turn, cell 1 1, you can see my pointer thing here. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. You're, you're also mine. Um, then in the next turn, it'll have my mark. And then finally, uh, one last bit. Every currently blank cell that wasn't marked stays blank. It's a little trickier. Um, so if it's currently blank and I marked something else, then it stays blank in the next turn. Right? 
Um, so here we see the first instance of OR, which is one of my pet peeves because the GDL spec does not define OR. It is not in the spec, but everybody uses it, and all the games that were written before the spec actually got put in a paper use it, and so you have to implement it because your player will just explode otherwise, um, which sucks, but it's computing, it's terrible, so that's, that's what we have to deal with. Um, there's also AND, but nobody uses AND because you can just list them out. Um, cool. Uh, and so that's it. Uh, if this all sounds like a lot of logic programming and you don't like it, uh, that's good because I've done the hard work for you. Congratulations. Um, so we've seen how games are fine. How do we actually run and like use these things and compute with these things? Um, so I wrote this thing called CLGGP, uh, General Game Playing. It's available at this URL. If you go to my Twitter account, I tweeted it so you can just click it. You don't have to type. I'm typing is hard. Um, it's loadable with QuickList, uh, but it's not in a QuickList this. Uh, so you have to clone it into local projects, and that's because I'm uh, lazy and haven't gotten it into QuickBooks yet. Sorry, um, I'm working on it. Uh, and so it works for some value of works with SPCL, CCL, ABCL, and ECL. Um, basically, it's fast in SPCL. It works with CCL, and if you use ABCL or ECL, come see me because there's one little thing you gotta, you gotta tweak. Um, but yeah. Uh, and so it's documented as well. I have a page of documentation. So, and like all Whispers, I wrote my own documentation system. So sorry, if uh, you hate me. I'm sorry. Um, but it is actually documented. So, like, if you want to actually do this stuff, uh, read the documentation. It will explain better than I can in the next 45 minutes how to actually do all this. Um, and so, if you actually want to follow along right now, what you need to do is clone down CLGGP and the logic programming library that it uses uh, in, into your local projects. So you'll just need to do this if you want to play around with it now or at lunch or whatever. Um, cool. So uh, CLGGP itself provides two systems, CLGGP and CLGGP.reasoner. And we're going to talk about the second one first, because we're talking about reasoning. So the reasoner package is a package that handles the underlying logic of the game. So taking a game state, figuring out who has or what legal moves are for any particular role, that kind of stuff. Um, so under the hood, it uses a logic programming library called Temperance that I made. Um, it's just an implementation of the Warren Abstract Machine, which is a prolog VM, and none of this matters if you don't actually care about it, because it's hidden from you, so don't worry about it. Um, but if you're interested, it's it's out there as well, open source. Um, cool, so let's actually look at this and make the computer actually do something. So the Reasoner API uh, has six functions, and then a hidden seventh one that I forgot to put on the slide that we'll talk about later. Um, but, so we'll start with uh, make reasoner, which use passive some of the old rules, like the, the list of rules that we saw earlier, that big, terrible slide, uh, and it'll give you back a reasoner. And then you can query that reasoner for things. You can say, what is the initial state of the game? And what are the legal moves for player X or whatever um, in, you know, in any particular state of the game? You can ask it if the state is terminal, you can ask it the goal value for a particular role, and you can give it a state and some moves, and it'll give you back the next state, right? So if we do this, uh, if we quick load it, and then we just read some GDL from a file, just for now, you would never do this uh, normally, but for fun, we can read the GDL from a file and pass it to make reasoner, and then we'll just define our, our reasoner, and then we can query our stuff. So uh, we'll say, hey reasoner, what's your initial state? And we'll spit back, oh, X has control, and cell one one is blank, and so are all the other cells. So the obvious thing here is, what is this GGP rules package? Um, so to the person who was talking about packages and conflicts and it's hard to resolve them when people do crazy things with packages, I'm sorry, you hate me too. Uh, I'm making your life more difficult. Uh, the problem is that when you're writing a general game player, it'll often play many games in the same, you know, same process. And I didn't want to clutter any particular game space with all of these thousands and thousands and millions and millions of symbols. Um, so the, the, eventually we'll see the player, and the player will end up clearing this namespace uninterning un all the symbols so they can get garbage collected. Um, but then, obviously, I don't want them to be in your package, because then all of your symbols would be garbage collected, and that would probably be bad. Uh, I don't know. Um, and so it, it has this GGP rules package. I'm aware that this sucks, but I couldn't think of a better way to do it. If you have a better way, uh, come see me. Uh, so, okay, so we can ask it for the initial state. We can also ask it for the legal moves. We can say, what are the legal moves for X in the initial state? Right? And so it says, okay, well, X can mark any one of nine cells, because all the cells are and likewise, we can ask it for O, and O only has one move. It's just no O, right? 
Um, I'm not going to go over the full reasoner API. You can just read the docs for the full story. It's actually documented. Read them. Um, and it's all pretty, pretty intuitive, I think, once you, you have the general idea. Like, it's everything, I guess. That's a tautology. So next, we're going to talk about playing. So we've got this reasoner, but how do we actually play against other people, like humans or, or other computers? That would be, that would be fun. Um, and so, again, the folks at Stanford, in that same document where they define the GDL, uh, they created the a, kind of a, a game slash network protocol to, to handle playing against each other. And so the way it works is there's a central game server that coordinates games between players. Uh, you write your player as an HTTP server uh, that just receives HTTP GET requests and spits back the responses. Um, the HTTP parsing is not a bottleneck here, so it's fine. Uh, it, does, it does the job. Um, and it's fairly easy to do in basically any language. Um, and so there's a bunch of central game servers available. Um, Stanford runs a competition every year, uh, almost every year, um, that most people or a lot of people compete in. But there's also public servers online that you can just sign up your bot for, put your bot on a VPN somewhere or a VPS somewhere, and just say, please pit my bot against other bots and see how it does. Uh, and so one of them is TiltGuard. It's on ggp.org. Uh, you can sign up there, I think. Uh, the next one is general-game-playing.de, which is the Dresden general game playing server. I think my advisor actually runs that server, so if it's ever broken, I guess yell at me and I'll yell at him. Um, you can sign up there. And then Stanford, of course, has their own. I don't know that you can actually register online for this. I think you have to email them if you want to register for this one. Um, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, and finally, there's also this thing called GGP Base, which is an open source implementation of this game master protocol, and a couple of other useful utilities. Uh, it's in Java and Swing, I know, it, it's fine. Uh, it does the job. Um, and we're actually going to see it later today, uh, when we actually run some code. Uh, so, back to the other part of CLGGP. We've got the reasoner, we can talk about, you know, we can move states around, we can see who, who can do what in a state, but how do we actually play against people? Uh, and so that's where the main system comes in, CLGGP. Uh, and so this has an even smaller API. And so basically all you need to do is subclass GGP player. It's just a class class like, like normal, and you can add whatever, whatever uh, slots you want, it doesn't matter. Um, and then you need to implement these four methods, or four generic functions. So there's player start game, player update game, player select move, and player stop game. Uh, and so player start game is called when the game starts, and you get the rules, and you get your role, so everybody gets assigned a role by the game master, and you get a deadline. Uh, and so in general game playing competitions, usually there's what's called a start clock and a play clock. And so the start clock is how long you have to pre-process these rules. And usually it's somewhere around 30 seconds to a minute. I mean, it can be anything you want, but most competitions seem to hover somewhere around that. So you get a little bit of time to think about the rules if you want before the game starts. Uh, and then update game is called before each, before each round, or after everybody is selected. And it also gets called in the very first one, and moves will be nil. And we'll see how this works when we actually look at some code. Uh, but basically, this is just your cue to say, okay, here's the moves that everyone did. Update whatever you need to update, and then move on to the player. Uh, select move is the next one, and that gives your player a deadline. And so this is what the play clock is. So you play, your player only has a few seconds to think about each move. It doesn't have forever to, to think about what it wants to do. Um, typically, this is somewhere on the order of 5 to 30 seconds per round. Um, again, depends on the competition. I think it would be interesting to try something longer rounds, but that's boring because then you have to sit there and wait for it to finish, so nobody does that. Um, research. So, select move is where your player will probably have most of its brain. Um, this is where you're going to decide what to do. Uh, and then stop game is just provided, it's called on your player when the game stops, and you can do anything like nil out memory um, or initiate a garbage collection if you want to, uh, just to make sure that, that you're ready for the next game. Because the idea is that you, once the bot finishes playing this game, it'll be ready to play another game. Uh, so enough talking and looking at slides, let's look at code, because that's the thing that you never never do in, in a presentation. So, one second, I'm just going to mirror my display so I can see what I'm doing. Oh my. Okay, can we all, can we all see this? Yeah. Good. Alright. We're going we're gonna to open up uh, a random player. We're going to open SPCL, and we're going to, oh my, move this over. This is a very small resolution. I'm sorry. Alright. Uh, so we've got our, our package, we're just going to be a CL user for now, and we're going to quick load our systems, just going to load them over there. Um, and so let's, sorry, I had that. 
Um, let's take a look at our random player. So, can everybody read this? Do I need to make it bigger? That's good. That's good? Okay, perfect. Um, so, our random player, uh, again, subclasses, GGP player, uh, and it's going to keep track of some information during the game. It's going to keep track of its role, so what role it was assigned for this game. It's going to keep track of its current state, so where am I in the game tree, and it's going to keep it's going to keep a reasoner. So one of those reasoners that I talked about is going to make one, and it's going to use it throughout the, 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 the entire game. So let's get start game. Uh, start game again takes the player, rules, role, and deadline. And now we're just going to ignore the deadline because we're not doing anything fancy. Uh, so, I mean, we're just going to, it's not going to be a big deal. So we're just going to ignore the deadline, it's fine. What could go wrong? Um, and then we're going to set the, we're just going to record our role. So we're going to say, okay, I've been assigned this role, I'm just going to remember that. And then we're going to create a reasoner with the rules. Sorry, this is line breaking, there we go. We're just going to make a reasoner with the rules that we were given. And we're going to store that in our reasoner slot in the class with our accessor. Yeah? Good? Okay. Um, for update game, it's a little trickier. Uh, so update game, like I said, it gets a list of moves, but on the very first turn, update, move, update game is called with null for moves, because there were no moves, you're, just, you're starting <coughs> the game. Um, and so we just say, okay, we're going to set our current state. If, if it's null, if moves is null, then this is the very beginning, and so we're just going to ask the reasoner, hey, what's your initial state? And so we're just going to set our current state to that. Otherwise, we did actually get some moves. And so we're going to ask the reasoner, hey, okay, given my current state and these moves that I got, what's the next state? Right? And so the reasoner is doing all the heavy lifting here. Right? This is just plugging the reasoner into the, uh, into the, the player API. Right? Uh, so let's look at select move. This is the, the meat of it. And I mean, it's only five lines, so it's not that meaty. Um, so again, we're going to ignore the deadline. What can go wrong? We're always network programmers. Um, we're gonna, and then we're gonna ask the reasoner, you know, what are my legal moves in the current state? And we're just gonna pick a random one. We're just gonna say, all right, just pick a random move from this list and return it. It's fine. Um, and so this isn't gonna play particularly smartly, but it will play legally. It'll always pick a legal move, assuming my code has no bugs, which may not be true. But it'll always play legally, uh, which is kind of cool, right? You can play any game in this class of games that we play <laughs> legally with just a few lines of code, which is, I think is pretty cool. Um, and then finally, in stop game, we're just going to nil everything out so that our list can garbage collect it if it's running out of room. Uh, we could, if you wanted to, uh, put you know a, a SDX to GC force or full T here if you wanted to, but I kept this platform agnostic. Um, cool. Let me actually eval all of this stuff so that we can run it and see it work. Uh, and then, so once you've defined all this stuff, what you need to do is just make an instance of your player. So we'll call it ELS Random Player, and we'll start listening on port 4000. Uh, to actually start listening, you run the start player function. So I'll do that over here, and you can see it's using Hunch and Toot, and let me, let me go ahead and make this the big one right now, so you can see what's going on. There will be some debug output, so we'll have to see what's going on. Uh, cool, so now we've got a player running, so let's play some games. Uh, so what we're going to do is go over to GGP Base, that handy Java library that I said. Uh, and we're going to run the kiosk. Uh, and so the kiosk is this swing app that lets humans play against bots. And so let's play a game of tic-tac-toe. Oh, jeez. Okay, this is very small. Um, so what, what for was it? 4,000? Yeah. Say 4,000. Uh, it doesn't matter the play clock because it's just returning the, a random move as fast as possible, so it's fine. Let's play tic-tac-toe. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the job of doing is not too friendly. Um, so the player goes first, or sorry, the human goes first, so I'm going to go in the middle because I can play tic-tac-toe. Um, and so we can see our random player, if we go back to the thing, we should see, this is the kiosk output, uh, we can see that our player got the, uh, the GDL, and then it responded with ready, and then it said, okay, it's time to play, and it responded with a no op, because it was O, and so it had nothing to do in the first turn. And now it responded with mark 2, 3. So we marked x2, y3. I don't know why it's reversed in this one, but whatever. Um, so now it's my turn again. I don't know. Let's go here. Oh, that wasn't smart random. <laughs> so, okay. So I, I, I can at least be a random opponent at tic-tac-toe. I, I haven't embarrassed myself in my family. Yeah. Um, Alright, so cool. We can play tic-tac-toe. Uh, we can also play different games, right? Uh, we can play Connect 4. Let's play Connect 4. So, if we go down here. Uh, you can see that it got the connect four, and it's starting as black, and red goes first, so it, it has nothing to do. 
Um, the kiosk is very generous in that it does not put a time limit on the player. Um, I kind of feel like it should. This feels unfair to me that we can take long, but it's really good for presentations. So, all right, let's let's go here. Ooh, okay. Let's see what you're doing there. Let's go there. All right, what if I go here? Oh, not there. There. Oh, that wasn't very smart. <laughs> Okay, so I can meet a random opponent at tic-tac-toe. I have still not changed my family. Good. Or at uh, Connect Four. Good. And so there's all these other games. You can play around with them. There's a lot more games that we're going to see later. But these are, these are the ones that have visualizations. So this is just like an HTML, CSS thing over here that pe whoever has gotten around to making a visualization for a game um, based on the state. Cool. All right, so we have a random player that plays legally. This is kind of cool. Um, let me go ahead and kill it before I forget so I can free up that board. Back to this. Sorry, I'm trying to make my life as hard as possible by trying to break the projector by mirroring and mirroring. Alright, play. Good. Alright, so uh, a random player is great, but that's kind of dumb. Uh, obviously, I can beat it really easily. Um, how can we make it smarter? Uh, and I know, I know, I know. The, the obvious answer is it's 2017. Just use machine learning, right? Like, put a neural network on it. What could possibly go wrong? Neural networks have never done anything wrong, right? Like, it's fine. Just, just put a neural network on it. Just download tons of like, Who even is that guy? <laughs> God. Okay. So, we're not going to use neural networks. We're going to go back to something a little more conventional. We're going to search, uh, if, if my space bar works, we're going to search the game tree. Um, and so, uh, well, we're going to talk about searching the game tree. And I say game tree because it's what everybody calls it. Um, but really, if you, th if you think about it, the moves are directed, right? They take one state and they go in a, in a specific direction. So it's really a directed graph. And because we said that the games have to be finite, there can't be any cycles. Otherwise, we'd have an infinite game. So really, it should be called a game DAG, like a, a directed asynchronous graph. But nobody calls it that, so I'm just going to call it game tree because uh, history, I guess. Um, and so, okay, how can we be smart about this? Well, if the game tree is small enough for a single player game, uh, you can just search it. Like for a small Towers of Hanoi game, you can just search the entire thing. Just step for a search, done. Just quit screwing around, you're done. Um, but okay, well, we're, we, we would like to play multiplayer games too, so, so okay, let's put minimaps on it, right? Let's, let's add minimaps into this. Well, okay, but we still have to search the whole tree, or at least until we find a winning moose, and maybe the trees are going to get big at some point for any interesting game, so I guess let's, let's do this alpha beta pruning thing, right? That'll, that'll cut it down. Right? And oh, maybe it's still too big, so, so we'll switch to iterative deepening. So we'll find something if it's good, and we can cut off at any point if we run out of time. And oh, it's still too big, so let's use transposition tables, which are just a fancy name for a cache. Uh, but there's a problem with this strategy, and it's that minimax and alpha beta need a way to evaluate states that aren't leaves. Right? If you, if you can't get down to all the leaves, and what we need is a heuristic. We need a way to look at a game's state and say, how good is this for me? So in chess, uh, they can do this by counting pieces and saying, total up my pieces and subtract my opponent's pieces. And that's some rough estimate of how good a given state is uh, for any, for me, right? But the problem is with general game playing, we don't have this, right? Any heuristic that we decide, like counting pieces, uh, you could think of a game that this would fail for. Maybe there's a game in chess where the goal is to lose all your pieces, or the, the goal is to checkmate the opponent, but you get a higher score if you have fewer pieces. Like, there, there's any heuristic you come up with, you can come up with a game to foil it, right? And so this is kind of a problem, because now how do we do minimax? How do we do alpha beta pruning if we can only do it when we're at the very bottom, right? Um, so this is a problem, uh, but luckily there's a solution, which some people find really beautiful and elegant, and some people think is a horrible, horrible hack. Um, I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. Um, it works, it's cool. Um, it clearly works because, so I talked about the general game playing competition, the international one that Stan rules. Um, since 2007, uh, Caddy Player, which is the, the player from the university that I'm at currently, um, they won the competition. And since then, every, I, I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on it, but based, almost every player since then has used some form of Monte Carlo search to do this. Um, and so what's Monte Carlo search? Uh, it's a glorious, glorious hack. Uh, so if we go back to thinking about our, our random player, um, what we would like to do is not just pick a random move, but pick the best move, right? Or at least a good move, right? Not a terrible move. And so what does a good move mean? Which of these moves is good? Well, a move is good if it leads us to a good state. Okay, sure. But what is a good state, right? That's the whole problem. We don't have a heuristic. So a good state, you could say that it's one where we're more likely to win, right? 
Okay, that seems that's kind of a wishy-washy definition, but yeah, it seems like something reasonable, right? So what does it mean to be more likely to win? How can we figure that out? Well, what if we just ran a random play out from this node, right, from this state? If we just played randomly from here, assumed everybody played randomly, right? What value would we get? Well, maybe this time we get a hundred. We say, oh, cool, this is a good state, right? We got a hundred. We're done, right? But then let's check ourselves and let's run another random play out. And oh, this time we got a zero. That's that's not quite as good, right? So. Clearly, if we go to the state, there's a chance of us winning, but also a chance of us losing. Um, and so, if we just throw computing power at it, and computing cores, and run uh, a thousand simulations of this, maybe we'll get some average expected value, and maybe it's 35 for this group. And if we do that for all of our moves in the first uh, in our list, uh, we'll get we'll get totals or average expected values for each of them, right? And so maybe the the move on the left, when we ran a thousand simulations, we averaged about a score of 35. And maybe the move on the right, we average the score of about 9. And then, or sorry, the middle is 9, and then the right is 79. And so if we're looking, now we've actually got some data. Uh, and we say, oh, the, the right state looks more promising than all the rest, so maybe we should do the right. Um, now, obviously, this is not perfect. Uh, there could be a move right, right after that middle one that ensures our win, that we, we would just win if we took the middle move. And we missed it, because our random number generator didn't send us down that path. Or it did. And it just got wiped out by all the other, all the other values. So it's not perfect, and there's ways to make this much better. Uh, but we're not going to worry about it for today. This at least gives us something to go on. Uh, cool. I'm on time. Good. And so now uh, we're going to look at the actual Monte Carlo player, and we're going to do it, and we're going to see if it can beat our random player. It's not not, very, not a very high bar, but we'll see. <laughs> all right, back to them. All right. So uh, let me go over here. And let's open up the Monte Carlo player. All right, uh, so we're going to stay in the same package. It's fine. Um, most of the Monte Carlo player itself is exactly the same as the random player. So if you look at the class, it's exactly the same. It has a role, a current state, a reasoner. The reasoner is going to get a bit more of a workout this time, uh, but but it's it's all the same stuff. So I'm not going to cover that too much. Likewise, the start game is exactly the same. Nothing has changed. We just record our role and set up our reasoner. Uh, update game is exactly the same. The actual playing of the game, you know, where we, we transition between states after people do their moves, is exactly the same. Nothing's changed. Sorry, let me eat all these as I go, so I don't forget. My bad. Okay. Uh, and let's just skip down to stop game. It's exactly the same. So, nothing different there. Alright, so that's all the stuff that's the same. Uh, so what's different is selecting a move. So, um, do you want to go top down or bottom up? Which do you want to see first? Top down? Alright, top down it is. So we're going to start with select move. Uh, set, no, we're out. There we go. Um, so basically what we need to do, now, now we're actually throwing computing power at this, so now we need to start paying attention to this deadline. Right? We can't just compute and simulate forever because we'll run out of time. Um, I didn't mention it, but if you run out of time and your response doesn't get back to the game master in time, the game master will just pick a random move for you um, and will just send you a message scolding you very harshly and saying you screwed up. Um, and if you do it too many times, some of them will just kick you out of the game and say, this is ridiculous, get out, come back when you can play. Um, but yeah, so we don't want that, so we're going we're gonna to make a little conservative deadline function that just says, okay, we have a deadline, and uh, just some seconds of breathing room, uh, and so uh, CLGGB just gives you the deadline, and that deadline is when your response needs to be back at the server. So it's up to you to decide how confident you are in your network connection, in your lists, GC pauses, stuff like that. I don't try to decide it for you, um, your adults. So we'll have a conservative deadline function, it'll calculate the deadline for us. Um, and so we just make this big loop. Um, I did use Gatorade, but I wanted to keep it nice and vanilla. Um, so we have conservative deadline, and we'll just say, let's start with two seconds. Um, give ourselves two seconds of breathing room. We probably don't need that much, but let's be safe. Um, and then we just pull out a couple of variables out of the player. So we just say, grab the reasoner and state the role, because we're going to use them a bunch of times. Uh, and then we calculate our moves. Let me even make this as big as I can for now. Uh, so we calculate our current moves, and we just store it in a, in a list. Um, and so then what we need to do is we need to run a bunch of random playouts from our current state for each move, and we need to record how much, how much expected value we get for each move. And at the end, we're going to pick the move with the highest expected value. right? So uh, I just did this really simply with scores just being an A list of move const onto uh, the score. So scores is just that, and it looks like this. So 
uh, at the beginning, all the scores are going to be zero because we haven't run any simulations. And then we just run until our current internal real time is greater than or equal to our deadline. So we run until we're, we're, we're done. And so on each iteration, we just loop through each move and we increment its score by the result of a random playoff, which is what we're going to see in a second. Okay, so far? Yeah. And then at the end, we just return the, the move with the highest score. So this is just munging the A list and, and picking the highest value. Cool. So that's select move. Let me let me do this again. <coughs> oh, I forget. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I don't know that function. Yet. So um, how do we do a random play? Well, so we'll start with a little helpful function that I wish this included on its own, but it doesn't. So um, so random element just takes a random element from a sequence. And so next, what we need to do if we go if we go back to our diagram. I listed these as single moves here, but they're not really single moves, right? Remember, every GDL game has simultaneous moves, right? It has um, every player moves at once. And so what we want to do here is we want to say, okay, um, when, I, when I go from one stage to another, the move that I want to make is actually a random move from each player individually, right? So each player just picks a random move. And so uh, in GGP, we call that a joint move. Um, just to distinguish it from a single player's move, and so a joint move is just an A-list of roles and moves. And so here's that hidden function that I forgot to include on the slide earlier, sorry. Um, you can ask a reasoner for the roles in a game. And so we just map over all the roles in the game, and we pick a random move. So we ask the reasoner for the legal moves for it, and we just pick a random, random move. That's it. Cool. So that's how you make a random joint move. Let me try you that. So here's the meat, uh, the actual meat, the random layout value. So again, this is a little tricky. Um, it's a recursive function, so it's gonna it's gonna eventually bottom out. So it's gonna bottom out when the state is terminal. So if we if we hit a terminal state, the value is the goal value at that state. So we just ask the reasoner for the goal value for the state for the role that we care about. So we're always asking for our own goal value. We're not trying to to make the opponents get less. We're trying to score as much as we can. We don't care what we. Uh, and so then we need to get a random joint move, which is, just uses the function we just defined. It just gets a random joint move. Now the tricky part is normally in our in our big play out here, you can see my mouse, nice. So in our play out, we want our character, our, our role, to play randomly, right? But the tricky part is we want them to take a particular move on this first this first transition, right? Because we, we have a particular move in mind, we're trying to, to find the value for. Right, so on this very first transition, we want to play random, or we want to play a specific move, but we want everybody else to still play randomly, and so that's the ugly part um, with the optional R move here. Um, so on the very first time, we're going to pass in the move that we care about, and when we get that, we're just going to we're just going to replace whatever the joint move had decided for us with that move. Um, I know it's ugly. There, trust me, there's there, this is the least painful way I can do it and still fit it on the, on the screen. So that's the only tricky part, and then all we do is recur once we're done with that. All the all the traversal happens in the recursion, and that's it. Cool. So uh, well, let's actually. Oh, I'm doing really well. Good. And then you're gonna have time for questions. Let's see. So let's get all this. So we got the Monte Carlo player, and let's start up. All right. So now we got a Monte Carlo player listening on four thousand. Um, so I could go into the kiosk again and try to beat it, but uh, I feel like I might embarrass myself. So let's make it play another robot instead. Um, so we're going to just go over here, and uh, so CL or sorry, GGB base also includes this player application. Oh, sorry, I'm not going to tell Java that it's okay to have a UI. Okay. So we're going to build this, and we're going to get a nice player UI. Yes. And so uh, GGP base comes with a bunch of really simple, uh, simple players. Uh, the one we're going to use is random, and we're just going to start it on board 9,000 something player. Right? So now we have a random player. Um, I could just start a list random player, the one that I just made, but I don't want the debug info to, to mingle in standard out. That would just be painful. So, um, oh, sorry. One thing I forgot to mention is back here, you might the the, the Eagle Eye amongst, amongst you might have noticed there's two select move things. I just made a second one that adds some debug output so we can see the, the results, the average expected value. Um, it's pretty ugly, but I, just, 
I added it as a separate thing. It does exactly the same thing otherwise, um, but it'll just add some debug output so we can see what's going on and see if this thing is doing what we think it's doing. Cool. Um, so ignore the, the second function behind the curtain. All right. And so uh, if we want to make bots play against each other, uh, we can't use the kiosk. What we need to use is called the server. So the game server. So this is a UI that acts like one of those tournament game servers. So we can set up matches between bots. Oh god. Uh, this might be tricky. I think I have everything I need. Yeah. Everything's listed here, right? There's supposed to be like a giant drop-down box down there where you can select like the players and actually see them. Um, okay, it's fine. We'll roll with it. Um, let's go to tic-tac-toe. Where's tic-tac-toe? Not tic-tic-toe. Tic-tac-toe. Yes. So as you can see, there's a lot more games in this list than there were in the previous one. Uh, because this is just all the games that it knows about. The other one was only the games that it had a visualization for. Um, so let's start, start clock at 30. This time our play clock actually matters, right? Because our Monte Carlo player is going to do as many simulations as it can in the time allotted with a few seconds of breathing room. So we're actually going to have to sit here for 10 seconds when it thinks about it. Um, and so let's make it play against random, and let's see how bad this UI looks when we start it. So let's start a new match, and it's playing. If we go over to it, we should see, oh, Right, let's try again. Try one more time. Sorry, one sec. Try the player. Try the player. Let's clean everything up. You know what? Let's make sure. We didn't restart SPC all our patients. That should be <coughs> Right? What could go wrong? Let's try the player. Alright, let's try it again. Oh, and now random is freaking out. Let's just. Yes. 
I know SDF, SDF, ASDF load works, it's fine. Um, all right, let's, let's try it. Let's try one more watch and see if we can get a little faster um, now that we've recompiled the logic library. And let's, ooh, there's some, there's some interesting ones here. Documentable, vanishing link. All right, let's see what we, province. Oh, okay, so we got, we got a few hundred more simulations. Uh, a, few, a few hundred more simulations. Um, cool. Yes, yeah, so like I said, it's faster on SPCL. It's not on anything else, but um, that's just because I only cared about SPCL. So it runs on th other things. But if you're interested in helping me make it faster, uh, let me know. Okay, cool. Let's let's run a bunch of these in the background and go back to the talk, and then come back and see how well we've done. Start ten matches, and it'll just queue them up. And it actually flips the roles each time. So you can see this time we're starting as X, but next time we'll be starting as O. So maybe random will have a funny chance. You know, if random starts as X, it might be able to draw the game at least. We'll see. So now we've got a Monte Carlo player. Uh, it's at least a little bit more intelligent, and now you know how to make an AI that can play general games. Congratulations. So uh, over lunch, you can make an AI that can play any game in that list, or at least any game that doesn't hit a bug in my code, uh, which may happen. Uh, which to me is kind of cool. Like in, in an hour, we, we can write AIs that can play just hundreds of games. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of places you can go from here. I've just given you kind of the lay of the land. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, so right away, the bottleneck that we hit, uh, with Monte Carlo search at least, is reasoning, right? All the time is spent computing these states and computing legal moves and stuff like that. And so if you can improve the speed of the reasoner, you can improve Monte Carlo search because more, more simulations gives you more statistics, right? And it makes you more, it gives you more information to work with, right? And so there's different ways to do that. You can write a faster prolog implementation. Uh, the one I wrote is, I don't know, kind of fast, but I'm sure people can do better, so feel free. Um, or you can actually, you know, shell out to a real prolog that's had 30 years of, of work on it and, and uh, use that. Um, so you can do, you can just do vanilla prolog, or you could do something more esoteric, like propositional networks. And propositional networks are a way of turning GDL into almost a circuit diagram. And so you can just propagate state changes through this diagram. So you don't have to recompute the state from scratch at every given point. If a cell just changes, if only one cell changes, maybe you only need to update this small subsection of the state. And for tic-tac-toe, obviously, it doesn't matter, but for bigger games, that can make a huge difference, especially games where this, most of the state stays the same the entire time, like chess. Like, most of the pieces on the board don't move. Uh, so this could be a big win. Um, it, just uh, look at the Wikipedia article for an intro introduction on that, um, and if you're interested, I can give you some papers as well. Um, yeah, so faster reasoning, more simulations, better, right? Uh, another thing to do would be to just improve the search itself. So obviously, we can parallelize this, just slap L parallel, on that do list and you're done, right? Like, just fill up all your pores, right? Uh, another thing to do is uh, Monte Carlo tree search. So for Monte Carlo tree search, uh, instead of just searching the moves, the very first moves at each given state, uh, Monte Carlo search expands the search tree each time it does a simulation. So it'll go down, it'll pick a move, it'll go down and it'll hit a leaf, and it'll say, okay, I'm gonna do a random playoff here, but I'm gonna expand this node, I'm gonna remember this node. And so over time, it builds the search tree as it does simulations, and that gives you a couple of things. Number one, it helps you find those killer moves, right? You don't just throw away all data after the first fly, right? It helps you find the killer moves, and it prevents obvious stupid mistakes, right? If you can see that you're, if you can do minimax, like a, a few steps ahead, it gives you at least a, a chance to avoid something really stupid. Um, and even more than that, it reuses the results. So right now, we're just throwing away all these simulations that we've done every time we do a move, right? But, we just spent like 900 simulations on this one move. Why would we? Why would we throw all that data? Away? <coughs> so you can do Monte Carlo tree search. Um, you can also do fancy things like adding heuristics in your playouts. So for our playouts, we just made everybody play completely randomly. But you don't have to do that. You can say, okay, sometimes these particular moves seem to be better, right, in the game. Like uh, in checkers, for example, it's sometimes or generally it's advantageous if we can capture a piece, right. So a capture move sometimes is better. Right? And so, in your random playouts, you can make your players play at least a little more smartly and maybe get some better heuristics, maybe get some, some better uh, statistics. And if you're interested in that kind of stuff, things to Google are MAST, M-A-S-T, and RAVE, R-A-V-E. Uh, and there's lots of variations on this, but it's all about um, adjusting the playouts to be not quite completely random. 
Uh, and finally, you can actually relax the restrictions. So the work I'm doing right now, my research is actually in this area, so on GDL2. Uh, GDL2 is an extension of GDL for handling games with incomplete information, like poker, where you can't see the other player's hand, and randomness, so non-determinism. Uh, so dice rolls, poker, card draws, that kind of stuff. Uh, so people are already working on this. Uh, there is a GDL spec for it, kind of. It's a little underspecified, but it's fine. Um, and CLGGP supports it, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can do that too. Um, there's also the other complete end of the spectrum, general video game playing. So if you're not interested in these game-theoretic state tree um, kind of games, you, and you're interested in video games, uh, the general video game people are doing this kind of stuff. So teaching computers to actually play games like Pac-Man or Frogger, stuff like that. Actual video games. Uh, so I think that's mostly it. I do want to check in on our player and see how he's done. <laughs> Go, uh, you can't see this, sorry. Here it displays. All right, let's go back to our, sorry, nope, that's the, uh, so let's see, did random ever, nope, random has never managed to win. Oh, of all these times. That's sad. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, you can also, you know, see a visual, you can, if you have a reasonable monitor, you can see a visualization of the games as they go in the UI, but. Um, should we see if Random can beat, uh, er, yes, should we see if Random can beat Monte Carlo at something else, like, to, er, like uh, Connect 4? Oh boy, Connect 4, Connect Variant 1, Variant 2, Connect 5, Connect 4, Connect 4 Large, Connect 4 Larger, Connect 4 Simultaneous, Connect 4... So, when we say general games, often we mean a game tweaked a lot of different ways to make it more interesting, but it's fine. Oh, the Hive Match button has scrolled off the screen. Alright, it's fine. Uh, let's only do one iteration of this, and yeah, let's scramble the GDL because it's fine. Oh, I just killed it because I started it with something that wasn't... That's gonna die, isn't it? Oh no, it says active. Okay, we're good. Let's go back. It is playing Connect 4 as the role of familiars. <laughs> we should just do this for the last like two minutes of this talk, is just look at the funny speakerphone. <laughs> What's that? True goldenrod anti ballistic insolence captioning. <laughs> Responding with sensibilities. Perfect. We're done. <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> um, I wish we could actually watch this, but I think it's going to be too big to see on this tiny, tiny little screen. We close all the tic tac toe games. Go to visualize. We... Aww. Can I scroll? No. What if I get my mouse right on it? No. no. Swing. Not having any of this. Oh, we already won. Alright. So, so Monte Carlo player can be brand new. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think we might have time for one or two here. And uh, I, I think lunch is next, so just come find me at lunch. Or if you want to play against this and see if you're smarter than the Monte Carlo player, come find me at lunch. And uh, here's some lunch.
I can ask my opponent, what did your partner's bid mean? And he has to be able to explain it in language. And if he can't, he can be disqualified from the tournament. Mm. And the, 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 the very interesting question is, which conventions are good conventions and which are bad conventions? Right, yeah. The French people play with certain conventions and Romanian people play with other conventions. And which ones are better? It would be interesting if you could encode the conventions in, a G, in like a bunch of DLBs. Very interesting indeed, yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone's done that, but I haven't looked, to be honest. Yes? Okay. Uh, so, I wrote this down. I'm going to try and yeah. uh, read it. But uh, I think, so uh, game playing is apparently an example of uh, rational behavior. Meaning that you, you make a decision that, ra uh, that maximizes expected utility. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that isn't always accounted for is the, the cost of estimating the utility. For example, in, in a pure Monte Carlo method, uh, mm -hmm. it can be very expensive. Yes. Uh, so is, it, is there anything in principle preventing you from using a tree search method which can tell when it's converging in a particular subtree. No, this is called a quiescent method. Like yeah, no, if you have a way to figure out when you're getting close to the right answer, by, absolute, by all means, yes, use that. Um, the problem is that in general game plan, we don't usually have an easy way to tell that, um, just based on looking at a bunch of scrambled GDL rules. Um, so Monte Carlo Tree Search does do a little bit of that. Um, usually what you do is uh, you balance exploration versus exploitation. So you want to explore the game tree, but you also want to focus on the areas that you think are promising. Um, and so in Monte Carlo Tree Search, as you expand this tree, you don't do it symmetrically. Um, you do the first level symmetrically, and then you, you expand the more promising branches a little more first. Um, and you kind of balance expanding these promising branches versus yeah, the so rest of it. The, the, the difference there is that sounds sort of like locally optimal, right? Like greedy. And, yeah. and a quiescent search uh, actually just just waits until the, the expected utility converges in a given subtree. Right. It would be nice if it did. Um, I guess the problem is that I don't know if you can do that. I don't, I, it, it's very hard because yeah. you don't know how big the subtrees are. You know, you don't know if you just sampled a tiny bit of it or a huge a huge bit of it um, without expanding, or at least having some heuristic to know how big do I expect this subtree of this thing to be. It would be tricky. Um, it would be really good if we could do that. So if you have a way to do that, please tell me. Yeah, you can do it for chess. Yeah, yeah. For any particular game, you can do it. It's The trick is doing it generally. There's, so there's an expression in the Dutch language of a swearing in the church, I think I'm allowed to do this. Yeah. Um, this is all essentially logic programming. Um, it, why are we doing this in this? Because if you took a, a, a good prologue implementation, it would be uh, several hours of magnitude faster. Sure. Uh, is, it, is it a...? Yes, so a lot of people do write their players in actual prologue implementations for that reason, because it's a lot, a lot faster. Um, you don't have to use prologue-style reasoning. Like I said, there's propositional networks and other things. Um, so theoretically, you could do that in Lisp easier, or for us, more pleasantly than, than we would do with prologue. Um, but yeah, some of it is just because I like writing in Lisp, and I like playing around with once I've got the reasoner just squir squirreled away, I can play with the other ideas and see what works better. And then if I wanted to, I could take the best thing that I have in Lisp and then rewrite it in Prologue once I've done all my exploration in Lisp. Because I'm more comfortable in Lisp personally. Um, yeah, not invented here. Sorry. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe this is capable of representing one zero sum game. Um, non zero sum games is a Yep. Yeah. So, it's slightly like a rich question. Do you ever see any kind of emergent phenomena from getting your players to play uh, non zero sum games like Christmas Dynamics or, or things like that, where you might see strategies come out of searches? So, an interesting thing, kind of related to that, is so since all the games have to be finite. Um, generally, most games will have some kind of a turn counter and say, after 50 turns, you give up as a draw. And so often, you'll have these really, really long protracted matches where people, where, where the players will prefer just drawing things out as long as possible to get to that draw rather than risk losing. Um, which is really annoying when you're sitting there waiting for it to complete and it takes 60 turns at 10 seconds a turn and you're just watching it play checkers really boringly. Um, but 
sometimes that's what it does. Um, yeah, I think since there's really no no sense of teams in, in this, um, at least in all the tournaments, it's every player for themselves, um, and just the player with the highest score wins. I suppose, I don't think you actually, the game server doesn't actually like, give you the other names of the players. So you can't say like, oh, he's winning, I want to just do the worst I possibly can to him, so that he doesn't get it. Uh, but there's a follow-up point then. The, um, you can encode your identity in moves. Um, yes. You know, not, not generally, but this, this has happened in game playing almost in the past. Oh, yeah. You get colluded, um, allegedly, anonymous identities. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you can, you can totally do that. Especially because the GDL is, is always ordered the same for every person. Actually, I don't, the Scrambler might actually reorder the rules, in which case your legal moves would usually come back in a different order. But you could, you could come up with a sorting credit to, to you, could, you could do it. I don't know that anyone has, but I mean, if they're good enough, I, I wouldn't know. That's the whole point, right? Um, yeah, I guess you could do that. Uh, but I guess since the, since the competition is usually every bot for themselves, nobody has really invested a lot of effort into it, or at least no one's written a paper about it. So, so that, that's an interesting idea. Okay. I think we need to break for lunch. If anybody has more questions, just find me one. We will be very happy to answer them for lunch.